Good morning. Good morning. Let's celebrate Jesus. You ready? Let's praise his name today. Be challenged by the word of God, but also celebrate first and foremost with this baptism. You ready? Let's praise him. Just three pe people, me and um, Miss Daniel and Mommy. Miss Daniel helped me with the prayer, and I um, asked him in my heart. So that um, everyone will know that I am a follower of Jesus, and that um, they'll know that Jesus is the one and only Son, Jesus Christ. Fear not, for I am with thee, Isaiah 43, 5. Um, learning about God and um, telling, I mean, singing songs to people at places. Good morning. This is Luke. He has come today to enter into the waters of baptism. Uh, if you're a family friend of Luke, you're here to support him this morning, would you stand just for a moment? We can recognize you. And thank you for being here this morning. It's a big crew. And we want to remind you of your responsibility as family to, to continue to disciple Luke um, as he grows in his faith. And we as a church promise to, to come alongside you and equip you and equip him as he matures in his faith in Jesus Christ. Well, Luke, do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? You do. <laughs> Upon your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. <laughs> we'll stand in the house of God. Start us out, Eli. Let's celebrate him.
more time. Above you, there's no other. You must consuming fire. Shake hands with each other. Say good morning. Two. It is great to welcome you to our service this morning. A beautiful and wonderful way to begin our service, seeing Luke baptized this morning. And earlier in the early service, his cousin Loudon also was baptized. So we're just praising the Lord for uh, both of these young men that have uh, come to know the Lord and have followed in uh, the waters of baptism. If you are seated on the inside of the aisle, would you please begin to know your neighbor for him? It's a little black book that lets you let others know in your row who you're seated near, and uh, you'll have a chance to uh, greet them maybe at the end of the service. Also, our uh, friend of the week is Faye Ellis. We remind you to hopefully get in touch with her uh, either by you know phone or card or or maybe just uh, have a little word of prayer for Faye. Uh, we miss having her out. All of our shut-ins used to be very active members, and we're here just as you are today, but uh, are physically unable to be out. This coming Wednesday, we want to remind you, uh, one of the ladies of our church that we told you earlier passed away, Sister Estelle Brown, where well, they're going to be having a memorial service this Wednesday at 1 o'clock at Devonshire. So if there's any way for anyone to make it, uh, the family would appreciate that this Wednesday at 1 uh, at uh, Devonshire. Also, this Wednesday is our quarterly business meeting, Wednesday night at 6.30. That will be in uh, the Fellowship Hall, so hopefully you will come and join us and be a part of that. We're looking forward and excited about next Sunday. Next Sunday, as you know, is Palm Sunday, and our uh, choir will be sharing in the Easter cantata, Bow the Knee, and you have an opportunity two different times at 2.30 or 6.30. So please let your family and friends and neighbors know about this so that you might invite them, that they might come and be blessed in this great way. Also want to let you know that we're going to a movie this Tuesday uh, at 545. We're going to meet here at the church. The movie is Noah, and that is uh, coming from, if many of you have been to Sight and Sound in uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, it's a theater up there. Well, they, they video and take picture uh, movies of that, and that's what's going to be on the movie theater. So we're looking forward to seeing that, and hopefully you will join us this Tuesday at 545. Many have uh, asked already why we're not having communion today. This is the first Sunday. Well, uh, we're going to be having communion the Thursday before Easter uh, at noon here in the sanctuary. You're invited to be a part of that, plus Friday evening. Uh, we'll have a special service at 7 o'clock, and then uh, certainly on Sunday, uh, Easter, 
we uh, hope that you will be out. We'll be having both regular services. It's exciting to be here. We're thankful that you're here. And uh, Brother Roger will come now and have our offertory prayer. Good morning. Uh, my name is Roger McClure. I'm a member of the Deacon Board, and I usually attend the early service, so most of you probably have never seen me, and, uh, but you've missed, missed out a lot by not seeing me. So uh, Hopefully, hopefully uh, I'll come back and do this every once in a while again. But anyhow, a while back, uh, Pastor Jeff spoke about using the smartphones. He used 1 Timothy to illustrate how we need to be smart and how we use our phones and, and such things in our lives. Well, I want to share part of First Timothy to show how people need to be smart in other ways in our daily lives. First Timothy, verse 17 through 19. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, not to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything to our enjoyment and to our needs. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation of the coming age. God has generously provided us abundantly, and we should be sharing our gifts back to him. Pray with me, please. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you for the abundant blessings in our lives. Help us to be joyful givers and sharers of all that we have. Use our return gifts to thy glory and honor. We ask these things in your holy name. Amen. It's not one or the other, 
It's hard truth and ridiculous grace to be known, fully known, and loved by you. I'm fully known, and loved by you. It's so unusual, it's frightening. I'm fully known, and loved by you. fun. Uh, if you're not doing anything next week, we're uh, going to be doing the Seven Saying Summit in uh, Fellowship Baptist Church in Barbersville. And um, each night there's going to be a different pastor there and uh, each church will bring their own praise man and things. We'll be there Tuesday night and, um, and uh, I'll be bringing the message and our praise band will be there and uh, they'll be doing some of Crowder's greatest hits, I think, and uh, so we, we're going to have a lot of fun, and I uh, hope you can come there that night. It'll be at 7 o'clock, and uh, each pastor will be taking one of the seven sayings that cross, Christ said on the cross, and, um, and so Tuesday night I'll be speaking on when he looked at his mother, Mary, at the cross and said, mother, or said woman, behold your son, and looked at John and said, son, behold your mother. And so we'll be looking at that saying and what it tells us. And so I hope that you can be uh, a part of that if you're available. I want to invite you to turn your Bibles this morning to uh, John chapter 17. John 17, and I'm getting a little bit of hissing up here in this guy right here, um, but uh, John 17 and verses 17 through 26, and um, last Sunday evening, our church overwhelmingly voted uh, to adopt uh, our proposed constitution and bylaws that have been being worked on for six years, 84%. I think it needed 66, and so overwhelming support for that. And I praise the Lord for that because I praise the Lord for our church. It's a blessing to be in a church where we can freely talk about things like that, and people can ask questions and feel like they can ask, ask questions. People can even feel the liberty to vote no 
if they're not supportive of something, but um, also to vote yes. And then for us to come together and move together as a family united for the cause of Christ. And that's what we do today. As, as, um, before I even came into the vote last Sunday evening, I had already sent this sermon to um, uh, the folks that put this together and the slides and everything. So it was already decided, this is what we're going to be talking about today, uh, whether uh, it passes or whether it doesn't pass, because we need to look today at the biblical definition of unity and what God's Word has to say about it. Because the Bible says in Galatians 5, 26 and 20, or 25 and 26, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So this morning, we approach a subject that is critical to our church. It's critical to any organizations. It's critical to every family. And when you look even at the fruits of the Spirit in the Bible, every one of them points towards this subject. And the subject is unity. God calls the local church to be united as a family. And, you know, we're a, a part of different associations and organizations and, co you know, we cooperate with different, different uh, associations and things. But there is one family. We hear associations uh, say, you know, we're all a family and this and that. But when these, when these commandments to be unified, to be in unity come, they come to the local church. And so it's the local church who is the family. If you've ever had a chance to go to California and visit the redwood trees, it's pretty amazing. Any of you guys ever, ever do that? Several of you have had a chance to see those. Those trees, some of them over 300 feet tall, they're enormous. And you would think that they would have deep root systems, but their root systems are not very deep at all. But here's the thing, their root systems are intertwined. And so when the storms come, the winds can blow, but they can't blow them over because they're all tied together. And in the same way, that's how God has orchestrated the church to be. Our root systems need to be tied together. That's why unity is such an important part of what Jesus wanted to say. You know, unity in the body of Christ, the church, is mentioned throughout Scripture. It was in the early church in Acts 4.32. The Bible says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common. Boy, that's uncommon, isn't it? If everybody in here said, You know what? This, what I have isn't just mine. It belongs to others. God has given me this so that I can be a blessing. Romans 12, 16 says, live in harmony with one another. 1 Corinthians 1, 10, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. You see, unity was a theme of the Apostle Paul. Right up to the end, it was a the theme of the Apostle Paul. It was also the theme right up into the end for Jesus Christ himself. Because Paul said these words in 2 Corinthians 13, 11. He says, finally, brethren, farewell. Now let me say something to you. The last thing that somebody says before they die, wouldn't you think it was pretty important? Wouldn't you think it would be something heavy upon their heart? Well, here's what he says. Farewell, be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace. Be of one mind and live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. But it was also important to Jesus. Our main text this morning is John 17 and verses 17 and following. And if you don't have a Bible, you can look at the pulpit because it's engraved on the pulpit. We believe that God's word is so important to everything that we do here at First Baptist Church. So important that we engraved it up on our, up on our pulpit what we're reading here is this is the great high priestly prayer of Jesus Christ. And this is right at the end of his ministry. And look what he says. He's praying to God, the Father, and he says, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in, believe in me through their word 
that they may also, but they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world, he says it again, may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. That's an awesome thought, isn't it? That Jesus prayed that God would love you as much as he loved him. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundations of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And Jesus, these are your words, and we thank you for them. And they are a reminder to us that you have called us. You prayed for unity among us. And so, Father, this needs to be a very important thing for us to embrace. And so, Father, I pray that you will guide us now in all truth for your glory and our good. And all of God's people said, amen. I want to give you three things that Jesus prayed for in this great high priestly prayer this morning. Prayed for the church. And notice the first one there in verse 21. Jesus prays for unity of the church. He prays for the unity of the church. You know, Jesus could have prayed for a lot of things right here. I mean, if you think about it, he could have prayed for his own strength in what he was about to endure. He could have prayed for the strength of his apostles that they wouldn't turn away and walk away and deny him. He could have prayed that his word would be adopted by those who had heard it, his teachings. But notice, instead, his prayer was dominated by a single great thought, unity. That was his main thought. Jesus knew that the church could never make the impact in the world that he wanted it and desired and died for if they were not in unity together. And so this is the thing he prayed for in this hour. Now notice, first of all, in verse 11, that Jesus prayed for the unity of the original disciples. That's who he's praying for. Now this was, this was quite a group if you think about it. This was no easy thing for them to be in unity. Because if you just think of the makeup, you had James and John, who, who they, you know, they said, they asked if they could sit on the right and the left hand of God in heaven, of Jesus in heaven. And it caused all kinds of outrage and jealousy among the disciples. And then you had the other disciples who were in this uh, debate about who was the greatest of all. And they had this tension going. And then you just think about the makeup. You had Matthew, who was a publican. You had uh, Simon Peter, who was a zealot. You had Matthew, uh, you know, uh, the makeup of them. Well, they were all different. There was a diversity among them. And so this was no easy thing. But that wasn't all. Jesus didn't pray just for them. He prayed for future generations to come. You and me. He prayed that we would have unity. Now, we need to note here very, something very important. Is that Jesus prayed for unity. You see, unity is something that is given. It's not something that is achieved. Jesus, otherwise he would have just looked at the disciples and said, be in unity. But he didn't do that. He prayed that they would receive unity. Rather that the Father would give them unity. See, unity is not something that we can fabricate. It's not something that, that, that we can generate. It's something that is generated by the Spirit of God. It's not something that is organized by a church. It's something that is emboldened by the Spirit of God. It's a gift. And so if we're going to be a unified people, we have to be a praying people. We have to pray and say, God, help me to have a spirit of unity among my brothers and sisters. So the pattern for unity of believers is unlike anything else. I mean, this is amazing if you think about it. This is nothing less than the unity of the Father and the Son. This is not merely the Father, uh, you know, this is not merely some kind of an organizational thing where we're united in our mission and vision. This is, I mean, just as the Father is in the Son, it says, and the Son is in the Father, 
We are to be so related in the local church. That's a huge thing if you think about it. Christians are drawn to one another. And we're drawn to one another because we're drawn to a common center. And that common center is Jesus Christ himself. You see, Jesus prayed, look again, that they would be in us. Because God is the source of all unity. We can't manufacture it. If we're going to be one, beloved, it's going to be that we're going to be one in Christ Jesus. Now, did you know that there were over 1,200 denominations in America? Over 1,200. I wrote down some of the names. Can you, can you believe this? One of them is the Church of the Kennedy Worshippers. Actual church. They actually pray to John F. Kennedy, the, the fallen president, and they believe that he can cure them of congenital defects and terminal diseases. There's also, there's the Church of the Ministry of the Universal Wisdom. And they look for flying saucers. Okay? It's an actual church that looks for flying saucers. There's also the Church of What's Happening Now. All right? I think I might want to go visit that church. Obviously, it's a contemporary church. But there are, there are and in those 1,200 denominations... Did you know that there are over 70 different denominations calling themselves Baptist? I mean, there's over 70 Baptists. I, I wrote down some of them. There's Seventh-day Baptist. There are two seed in the spirit predestinatarian Baptists. Okay, that'd take a big sign. There are General Baptists, Regular Baptists, American Baptists, Southern Baptists, Independent Baptists, on, Free Will Baptists, on and on and on and on. Now, let me ask you a question. Is that really the kind of unity that Jesus had in mind when he prayed for unity for coming generations? Do you think that was it? I don't think it was. Now, let me, let me pause here for a minute because I have to say that this passage of Scripture that we're in today is a favorite passage of Scripture for ecumenical movements. Um, and, and listen, the divided church is a tragic thing. But the answer to the divided church is not institutional unionism among other churches, among all churches. Jesus was not praying here for the unity of a single worldwide ecumenical church with doctrinal heresy that would be maintained alongside of orthodoxy. That's not what he's praying for. He was praying here for a united people coming together, being obedient to his word, yielded to his Holy Spirit and his will. That's what he's praying for. Because there's a great difference between unity and uniformity. He's not praying for uniformity. Everybody looking alike. He's praying for unity. Everybody together under the same thing, his his will and his word. Pastor Warren Wiersbe had something good to say about this. He said, quote, Christ never prayed that all Christians would belong to one world church. Organizational mergers may bring about organizational uniformity, but they cannot guarantee unity. Unity comes from the life within, not from pressure without. While true Christians belong to different denominations, they are all a part of the true church, the body of Christ. It is this spiritual unity in love that convinces the world of the truth of the gospel. It is possible for Christians to differ on minor matters and still love one another in Christ, end of quote. Now, let me give you the second thing that Jesus prayed for here. Notice notice in uh, in, in, in the next verse here, Jesus prays for the impact of the unified church, the impact. Notice he says that the world may believe that you have sent me. You know, only the reality of these united disciples with all of their diversity coming together would convince the world that the gospel was real. Jesus knew that. In fact, John 13, 35 says, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you what? Have love one for another. So if there's that unity, there's that love, the world looks at that and says, wow, we can't figure this out because with all the division in the world, how can they be in unity? Something's going on there. You see, there was a survey recently done. 90% of Americans, I'm sorry, 80% of Americans surveyed said that they believed that our country had disunity right now, that our country was divided along certain lines. And I think we would all agree with that. As you look at the news, you see it everywhere. 
But the thing is, is 90% of those people surveyed felt that it was a serious problem. And I believe we would agree with that. It is a serious problem. Disunity is a very serious problem. You know, now some people believe, well, if you can just unite everybody under the same theology, then that will fix the problem, but it won't. Only one thing will compel the world to believe the gospel. And Jesus brings it out right here. It's a supernatural oneness in the family of God. It means old folks and young folks and folks of all ages coming together and finding common ground together. I asked permission to use this, but we have a gentleman in our church, he's, he's in the first service, Dwayne Bush. Dwayne Bush is a retired public school teacher, and he's, he's a member of our church, as I said, and I'm always amazed at some of the substitute teaching job assignments that he gets and takes. In fact, last week, he, had a, uh, he, he was called to be a substitute teacher, a physical education teacher at Tay's uh, West Taze Elementary. Here's the thing. He's 87 years old. Dwayne Bush is 87 years old, and they asked him to come and be the elementary school phys ed teacher for the day, and he accepted it. And he said he walked in, and this little boy walked up to him and looked him up and down and said, you're old, but you're in good shape. <laughs> well, that little boy and Mr. Bush got along well because they had common ground together. And they work with each other. You know, loving each other, honoring each other, preferring one another. And by the way, if you're sitting right here now thinking, I hope these old people are listening to this. Or you're thinking, I hope these young people are listening to this. Well, here's the thing. I hope you're listening to this. Because we all need to understand how important unity was to Jesus Christ. You know, a truly unified community of people is a supernatural fact that must have supernatural causes. And as the world looks at that, they go, wow, can't figure that out, except maybe what they're saying about God is real. Have you ever walked into a family argument? I mean, you like walk into a room and like, they're like at each other and you're like, whoa, awkward. And you just want to kind of back out because it's so awkward being in the presence of a family who is fighting, whether it's a husband or wife or brothers or sister, whatever, you just want to kind of get out of there. Well, think about it. That's how the world is. When Christians are fighting amongst themselves, they don't want anything to do with that. They just want to back out of the room because there's nothing different about that. So we're to have unity. Well, where are we to have it? Um, if you'll notice, there's two places that he wants us to have unity, that Jesus wants us to have unity. It's inside the church and outside the church. In the church, I have to be a unifying force in the church seeking common ground bringing people together I had um I was a pastoring a church in Kentucky I had this little old lady in our church and she was the sweetest thing but boy on this particular day she was in the hallway and this old man who likes to just he just liked to sow seeds of discord came to her complaining you know people who have a negative spirit and complain they're like pecking you to death it's like being pecked to death by a duck I mean, they're like, they like peck, negative, negative statement, negative statement, negative, 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 negative. Just peck you to death like a duck. And you're like, Grr! you know, it just bugs the life of me. I mean, people who are negative, always pecking at you. And so this guy came up pecking at her with these negative statements. And she stopped him dead in her tracks, sweet little lady, and said, Fred, you're trying to sow seeds of discord in our church. I love you. Turned and walked away. Praise the Lord for her. We need more people like that who will stand up in the face of disunity and answer to it. Now, the second place is outside of the church. Do you know that right now, all over our community, there are people that are sitting home that could be here? And a lot of times, the reason they're sitting at home is because they know that tomorrow, many people in churches will go into the workplace and they will talk about other Christians and they will behave and their, their language and everything about them says to them, there is no unity there. And it's like that conversation, they just want to back out of the room. They don't want to be there. This needs to be a place where we're built up, where we're encouraging one another. And let me tell you something, people are hungry to be encouraged. There are people, you know them. You know them, you work with them, you know there are people, you can name me dozens right now, who just need encouragement. They just need somebody to be there, to know they're in the corner for them. This is what this place needs to be. 
And I believe it is. But we need to guard that. Because if we don't guard it, Satan knows the very thing that Jesus was trying to preach and make sure happened in the church, unity. He wants to make sure it doesn't happen. And he will use people to try and sow seeds of discord. Now look again at Jesus, what Jesus says in the text, that they may also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Jesus is like, look, if you are in them and they're united, then the world's going to look at that and they're going to believe that you sent me. Let me, let me say this. If, if believers would just guard their lips and just say what I say will be unifying rather than dividing... And when I hear that which is not unifying, not only will I refuse to participate, but I will refute it to its face, just like that little lady in that church in Kentucky. Praise the Lord for people to do that. Well, let me give you the last one. Jesus prays for the glory of a unified church. He says, I have given them the glory that you have given me, verse 22. Now notice he doesn't say, I will give them the glory. Here's why. Because believers have already been glorified through Christ. We're as good as in heaven. After the morning service, I had the opportunity to visit back there uh, in one of the pews. Everybody had left, and I got to visit with a, a, a young, uh, with a young girl who came up, and she said, How do you get saved? And, and I sat down with her and took some time and explained to her how we are all sinners and gave her examples of how she was a sinner and how we are all sinners and how if we stand before God guilty, he's going to have to send us to hell. He can't send us to heaven if we're guilty. He's a, he's a just God. But how Jesus Christ came and died for her sins. And I could just see the weight of her sin on her little shoulders. And, and what had happened is she had seen that baptism by Loudon in the first service and it made her, and, and in his testimony, he, they said, why do you want to get baptized? He said, that, so the other people will know about Jesus. Well, it happened. It works. Because she saw that and she wanted to know about Jesus. And so as we sat there and I explained to her, you know, get, being saved is admitting to God that you're a sinner and then asking him to come into your life and save you of your sins. And, 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 and he will save, and she, she, you could see the weight of her sin. I said, do you, do you want to do that? And she said, yes, I want to do that. And I didn't say, repeat after me. I said, well, you know, just what we've talked about, just say it to God like he's here with us. And she prayed the sweetest little prayer and said, God, I admit to you that I'm a sinner, and I can't save myself, and I'm asking you to forgive my sins and be my Lord. And, and she said, so that I can tell other people about you. Praise the Lord for that. And when she, when she said amen and looked up, you could see, I said, did you, believe, did you mean what you said? And she said, yes. And I said, well, then God saved you. And you don't have to ever doubt that again. You can see the way to lift it. Not because I said it, but because God's word said it. And see, that's what it is. Jesus was like, look, if you're, if you're in unity, they're going to see that something, there's something supernatural going on there because this isn't normal. That people take care of themselves, take care of each other like that. But this is also a very good picture of eternal security. I want you to notice several places in the text. First of all, in verse 2, believers are the Father's gift to the Son, and God will not take back his love gifts to the Son. You see, if you're born again, you are a gift from God the Father to God the Son. Remember Jesus said, they can't, pluck, you can, they can't be plucked out of my hand because my Father, who's greater than all, has given to them to me and nobody can pluck them out of his hand. So you, if you're a born again believer, if you've trusted in Jesus Christ, you're in Jesus' hand and nobody can pluck you out. Eternal security. Once saved, always saved. All right? The other thing that I want to show you is Christ finished his work. Because Christ did his work completely, believers cannot lose their salvation. You see, if you're born again because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, Jesus finished his work. What did he say before he died? It is, it is, it is, it is finished. It is finished. He finished the work. And so your salvation is secure in him. Another one, Christ knows that he's going to finally be in heaven because he was all, he's already been glorified. So he knew that we would be in heaven. He actually prays to the Father. I want them to be in heaven and see me in, all, in, the, in my glory. And that's the fourth thing is God the Father always answers the prayers of God the Son. Show me any place 
in the word of God, where God the Son, Jesus Christ, prayed and God the Father didn't answer the prayer. And he prays here that if you're born again, trusted in Jesus Christ, you'll be in heaven with him. And guess what? God answers the prayers of his son. You'll be in heaven with him. That's another eternal security that you have, according to God's word. Now listen, church unity is not an easy thing. It's not. There was a famous 19th century philosopher by the name of Arthur Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer. And here's, he once used the porcupines as an illustration of this. And he told the story of a group of porcupines that were marooned in the bitter cold one night in the middle of a field with just blistering winds. And to stay warm, what they did is they huddled together. But as they huddled together, their, their things, quills, yeah, those things, started sticking each other. And, and, and the closer they got, the more it would hurt. And finally, some of them were like, you know, I'm out of here. And they got away. And the next morning, they were found frozen to death, dead. And he used that illustration to say that just like in, in churches, you know, sometimes when we huddle together, we kind of stick each other a little bit we kind of sometimes maybe hurt each other a little bit but the answer is not to go it alone the answer is to understand that God has given us each other now I have this box of crayons um, that somebody gave me years ago it has a little note on the back that they wrote me a little note I was in a, a church where they were but it's a full isn't there, there's nothing really makes you smile more than a box of fresh crayons isn't it just a smell of them reminds me of kindergarten some bad feelings from kindergarten too so maybe I won't smell them that much but the unique thing about these crayons is there are different colors there are different sizes and they have different functions but they all fit in the same box together to accomplish what crayons accomplish just like a church if you think about our church our church is diverse we're different colors we're different experiences we have different worship styles we have different ministry uh, ideas we have some some of the you know like in the, in, a, in, a, in a box of crayons some of the crayons are new some of the crayons are old any old crayons here some of the crayons are like worn down to a nub because we've worked you to death you know but the, here's the thing they all fit in the box together just like in a church and that's how God intended it because it doesn't take a genius to look at this box and know that these are all different but they all fit together to accomplish whatever it is that crayons accomplish likewise God has brought us together in all of our differences all of our diversities all of our yes votes no votes and all of these things but he's called us to be in unity as a church for his glory so that the world will look at us and say, wow, look at all of those crayons fitting together in that box. Something supernatural must be going on there. That's how God designed the church to be. And I pray that all of us will make it our personal mission to protect the unity of this church. Not just to not be a dividing factor, but to be a uniting factor. To look for that common ground. To be a person who, when they see disunity trying to creep in, that they don't only refuse to be a part of it, but that they refute it to its face for God's glory and what he designed our church to be. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, uh, so much for your word and for this reminder of unity. And, and Father, I, I, I pray that, um, that if there's someone here who maybe they haven't been a disunifying factor, but God, that, that maybe it is that they just haven't refuted it. And I pray that you will help us to do that as well. But Lord, that we will look for ways that we can bring people together, not bring them apart. Lord, we never want to do that apart from your word. We don't want to say, well, let's just ignore what your word says about certain things. And there will be times, Lord, where we cannot find common ground in an error. And we need to hold fast to the truth of your word in those situations. 
but we can always do it in love. And we can always do it in a way that may, you may use that to draw people to yourself for your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask everybody to stand, and I'm going to ask you to do something that might be a little awkward for you. But, um, and I didn't tell you guys we were going to do this, but what I'd like to do is I want to pray for the unity of our church. And I would like for all of us to join hands together across the aisles, all through here. Don't let the chain, if you have to move around, move around. Don't let the chain be broken with you. You guys kind of drift down this way because you're part of it too. And um, I'll come over here and you grab that hand and I'll grab this hand. There we go. You got your guitar. All right. All right, everybody connected? Let's pray together. Father, Lord, we thank you and praise you for the unity that we have in Christ Jesus. And Father, as Jerry prayed in the first service, that Lord, we would not only hear these things, but we would do them. That we would realize, as he prayed, that this is a gift from you. It's not something we manufacture. And so, Father, I pray, Lord, that you will grant us that gift of unity going forward in our ministry. That First Baptist Church will continue to do wonderful things for your glory and for our good. We thank you for every crayon that you have brought into our box. And we pray that you bring many more. Many more who are different colors. Many more who are, have different functions, new and old, young and old. And Father, we pray, Lord, that you will help us to use your word and through your Holy Spirit that we will all be sharpened for your glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. Go ahead. You might want to remain standing. of every song we could ever sing. You are worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Say the name of Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. we thank you for your sweet Holy Spirit. We pray for unity, God. And we ask you to lead us by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray and amen.